my first guest tonight is one of the most dynamic voices in the country. Akala is a hip-hop artist, best-selling author and social entrepreneur. In 2006, he won Best Hip-Hop Act at the MOBA Awards with his debut album, It's Not A Rumour. Since then, he's released three more albums, a hit biography, and has become known for his passionate activism, appearing in multiple TV debates, and recently released his debut novel, The Dark Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Akala! How are you doing, you right? I'm very well. Thanks for coming on the show. No, no worries. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. No, thank I've you. I've been trying to get you on the show for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just been, I don't know, it's been difficult. We're trying to get some new music together and trying to find the right time, but I feel like we found the right time now. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I'm looking forward to it. And with, there's, there's lots to talk about. So first things first, you've got a new novel out. That's I called do, yeah. The Dark Lady. It's your first yeah. novel, isn't it? First novel, yeah. The Dark Lady. Yeah. What's it about? So it was inspired by, Shakespeare wrote a series of sonnets called The Dark Lady Sonnets, and it was inspired by that, and then backed up by some great scholarship. A scholar called Miranda Kaufman wrote a book called The Black Tudors, and obviously I started the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company in 2008, so I've always been into the Elizabethan era in general. And so a lot of the research I did about life in London then, and just the Elizabethan theatre and how things were, I kind of wanted to write a novel set in that world, but I didn't want it to be about an adult, so I imagined that this woman had a son, and it's around her son, who's basically a genius from what was at the time London's worst slum, or one of the worst slums, a place that was colloquially known as the Devil's Gap. And it, so, that, so is it is it based on your kind of knowledge of history, or is it sort of fabricated, or is it a bit of both? So it's historical fiction. So a lot of the stuff that happens in the book. So for example, they go to see Hamlet, and they go to see Romeo and Juliet. Um, they are witness to lots of things that happened in the Elizabethan era. Right. But they happened across a period of five or six years. I've condensed them into one summer. So there's a note at the end of the book to talk about where I've bent history and where I haven't. Right. The map and the layout of London is, is based on how London really oh, right. was at the time. Um, the accounts of what occurred when they go to the theatre is really based on accounts of what happened at the time. It was much more rowdy. Like, going to the theatre back then wasn't like going to the theatre now. Yeah, well, it it's, was... it's so different. Like, and the stuff around Elizabethan theatre was, like, properly wild, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, everyone who owned a theatre also owned a brothel. Yeah. I mean, it was... No, it's true. Yeah. It was fully part of the underworld. Like, it was outside of the city. Yeah. You know, down there on the South Bank, next but to the prostitution so and the strange, bear isn't it? Like, going to watch Wicked and then getting a hand job Seems so... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's but that's what people, that's literally what people were doing. It was just really, really underground, really gritty. I mean, you entered the city gates of London back then, yeah. and there were rotten body parts of executed dissidents on the city gates on the entrance into London. Yeah. So all of that sort of stuff that I've put in there about how gritty London was, about how much of an immigrant population there was in London at the time, about there being a French quarter, uh, about just the relationship between the state and the people, it being very, very repressive, the extreme poverty and so on. All of that is based on the primary source material yeah. of what Elizabethan London was really like. Because that's the fascinating thing, that people might have an assumption that Elizabethan Britain is, is purely white. Mm, but it true. really isn't the case, is it? Well, it's not just... That, that, that's true that that wasn't the case. There was a... As I mentioned earlier, the book The Black Tudors deals with the black presence specifically, but also London was already an immigrant city, as much yeah. as that would annoy people. I mean, the Africans that lived in England at the time, because Britain hadn't fully yet entered the transatlantic slave trade, you have a man like... Uh, John Blank, who was at the court of uh, Henry VII, he was paid. We have receipts for his work. The guy, Graham, in my book, is based on a real character, an right. African who was living in Elizabethan England who made needles and, and was a worker. I mean, there was racism, obviously, but there's, it's important not to project back the last three or 400 years of history into a period in which uh, a lot of those things were not foregone conclusions. So you've spoken a lot about um, uh, racial disparity in the last... And, and obviously... It's, it feels like the conversation has become mainstream in the last couple of years. How does that feel? Um, yeah, it's good that there's a conversation. Um, what will come out of it, where America will go from here, where the world will go from here, I, I don't really know. Um, as someone whose art and music and, and work has always spoken about those kinds of issues, the last couple of years have been, been pretty fascinating. But what the legacies of 2020, so to speak, will be remains to be seen. Mm. It's kind of that thing like where you can sort of... You, you still see with footballers taking the knee and people getting angry about that, even. Well, also, it's just an odd thing to get upset about. Yeah. Uh, you know, for decades, for... Obviously, it's, you know, coming from America, but for decades, footballers in this country 
people throwing banana skins at John Barnes. And remember, at the time, John Barnes and other black footballers were seen as sort of the troublemakers for saying anything. And that, there's always been a sort of strain of, of that. That's the funny thing is people today will look back and say, oh, it was, it was pretty bad in the 80s, wasn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. You know? But that isn't what was said at the time. And even more fascinating, when you go back even further than that, to much more extreme versions, say in the 1920s in America, you realise the same sort of thing was being said. Oh, don't complain about lynching, you know. Other people get lynched too, so it's not about race kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so there's always been sort of this strain of, of, of denial and, and, and it just is what it is. Do you feel like, the, like a, a, a sort of a weight of responsibility to talk on an issue like that? Um, I do, but I've, te I've chosen to have an opinion. I, went, I have a very particular, I had a very particular upbringing. I went to a special Pan-African Saturday school. I was politicised very early. My parents were very active in the anti-apartheid protests. I grew up in a special theatre called the Hackney Empire. I don't think it's fair that basically every black person that goes on TV has to have an opinion. Yeah, sure. But, but I think the difference is I've chosen to always have an opinion because I, I grew up in the sort of vein of a, of a Chuck D, Gil Scott Heron, Bob Marley, Dennis Brown. I never really knew till I got older that musicians didn't have an opinion on everything because all of the music I listened to growing up just had an opinion. Um, I think it's only really in the last 20 years that music has probably perhaps not done that so much. And, that must have been such a fascinating moment to go from like highly politicised songs to like listening to the charts. Yeah, yeah. Read of like, what the fuck in the Spice Girls? A zig like, <laughs> listen, I don't know. What's a zig a cigar? Fam, don't knock the Spice Girls, you know. No, the Spice Girls were cold, but I hear you. Like, <laughs> listen, I remember zig a zig oh, yeah? yeah. Shout out to Mel B. Um, <laughs> no, listen, now, listen, that kind of music has its place, but I'm saying yeah. in, my, in my household, maybe it's just because of how my parents were, yeah. my dad ran a sound system, it was, it was very heavy. Um, and so it's only when I came out into the world, I realized this isn't what musicians do. The first person I ever saw give a lecture was an African-American rapper called KRS-One. His KRS-One stands for knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. So a lot of what was pushed sort of as mainstream rap and what became mainstream rap, those of us who were hip hop heads, so yeah. to speak, that isn't our perception of rap and isn't what we grew up on. Yeah. So I always grew up thinking, of course rappers have an opinion or read yeah. books. KRS wrote books too. Wu-Tang, you know, if you're, if you're a nice kid, Wu-Tang used to use words like benevolent and cometh yeah. in a rap song. Like, very overtly, deliberately Shakespearean language. Yeah. Even though half of them have been to prison, they've been shot, they came from one of the worst housing projects in America. All of those cliches, but they really made it cool to be smart. Or in a Jamaican context, there's a Jamaican dancer MC called Bounty Killer. You know, he'd rap about the violence in the ghetto one minute, and then he literally had a song called Book, 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 and how important it is to go to school. So I never saw that as a sort of contradiction. So uh, one thing I love about you is you're not afraid to debate and converse with people who hold different opinions to you. In a world where people are trying to be shut down for having the wrong thing to say, you're more than willing to, to uh, joust with them. And I really like that. Um, everyone draws the line somewhere. Yeah. There are some people I consider beyond the pale sure. and I wouldn't want to give them a platform in terms of debating with them. Uh -huh. But I do also believe like one of the things of getting older is you also realize you're not that smart or that important. And actually there are other people who have legitimately different views mm. on everything, economics, history, politics, so on and so forth. And I, tr I try to own that. And that's why I suppose I'm open to, and I also think lots of people have never been intellectually challenged before a lot of the time. And so often when people are presented with a particular set of views, particularly if it's balanced by or backed by evidence and logic and a clear argument and someone's been thinking about it for a very, very long time. I find lots of people I end up talking to have never come up against somebody like me from a background like mine and not yeah. even aware of the whole Pan-African Saturday School movement and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's important to... Uh, the alternative to, to, to debate is not pleasant. But that's the a crucial thing, isn't it? That, that we live in times where everything has to be black or white and everything is absolute and yet... But, but do we? Things are changing all the time. I, think, I, think I wouldn't take Twitter for the real world. Com completely 100% agree with you, but what's being sold in papers is Twitter and all this and all the little small stories. And also, if people spoke as rudely in real life as they did on Twitter, a lot more people would get their teeth knocked out. Like, yeah. <laughs> Twitter's not the... I would say, I'm, in fact, I'm, I don't, no one steal this. I've got a chapter in a new book I'm working on or a sort of device that I'm calling Twitter versus the barbershop. Right? How people talk on Twitter versus how a man talk in the barbershop, very different. Because in the barbershop, there are consequences for being rude. Yeah. And there are consequences for being disingenuous or overly sarcastic or failure to understand or at least attempt to understand someone. And so look, Twitter's Twitter. And yeah. it just encourages sort of adversarial and social media in general gives that un un 
uh, anonymous nature where you can be rude and not get punched in your face. Exactly. And, and therefore, sadly, face to face, people are often much more civil and, yeah. and, and much more uh, aware that there's, there's a level of rudeness beyond, and sim simplisticness beyond which it's much harder to go when you're, when you're face to face and talking to someone. Do you feel a sense of pressure upon you to be a certain way sometimes? I was, th I was thinking then, because you're talking about liking the Spice Girls, for example. Do the you Spice have Girls like, are cold, bruv. Two become you... one. What? That's a rhythm. Don't, don't play with I'm me. I'm not, no. but I'm saying... That's a big tune. Do you have kind of guilty pleasures that people wouldn't assume that a Carla is into? Do you mm. know what I mean? Ish. <laughs> no, I like Angels by Robbie Williams. You know, I watch Friends. Um, if people knew in real life, I'm, 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 I pride myself on being really, really silly. Yeah. Like in real life, like anyone who knows me is like, I'll just be talking to you and I'll just do really silly things for no reason. I don't know why. I'm very zany in real life. Well, it's I'm not the way trying to be. Look, you've got to be childlike, not childish. Fuck yeah. I, I you know, I go carnival, like. Go Trinidad, I drink my rum, I do my thing, but it's, it's, I don't know, I'm not, um... I do feel a pressure to be a certain way sometimes, but that's a prison of my own making, in a way. Mm. Like, I'll be in the party sometimes, and people will come up to me and say, oh, my God, I'm so surprised to see you out. And I think, what, you think... Because I read books, I'm a hermit. Like, have I given people the impression that I'm like a Shaolin monk or something? And, and maybe that's my fault. Maybe I need to rap about sex more often or something. I don't know, like... <laughs> I have sex, yes, I do. You know, someone even... Someone asked me that question in an interview once, <laughs> like... I was like, bro, and it was a man. I was like, bro, do you think I'm a monk? Just because I don't, you know, I don't choose well, he, to... He, he, he said, do you have sex? <laughs> he didn't say exactly but he... that question, but it was like, it was almost like he was talking to me as if I was an asexual being. Right. Because, like, the assumption is, uh, uh, particularly as a, uh, as a rapper, that if you're not rapping about sex all the time, you're not having any. And I was like, mm, no, I just... I don't, and I don't really have a good explanation as to why. Like, I love quote unquote, for want of a better word, ratchet dancehall music. Like, Jamaican dancehall music, anyone who listens to it will know, is the most sexually explicit music in the world. And I love it, it's some of my favorite music yeah. in the world. It's great, I'm not actually judgmental of other people's um, ability to credibly make music that is overtly and brilliantly and viscerally sexual. But it just isn't your... I just can't do it. Yeah. If I could do it, if I was Prince and I could sing, which I can't, right? <laughs> if I could do all of that, I would. But, but I can't credibly do a Prince and make a song about head and it'd be brilliant. It just wouldn't work for me. It doesn't, it doesn't sit with everything else I've done. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that I... I don't know, that I don't enjoy certain things. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, of course. I, but yeah, I, yeah. I have... Even the fact I can't say it, right? <laughs> sh shows you that I have... I don't know, I have a... Uh, it's like I'm scared that my mum's watching us. All right. <laughs> But yeah. So interesting. I could talk to you for ages, man. Um, and you're actually going to do a live performance for us later. We are, yeah. I'm really looking forward. It's, it's an ensemble piece. Yes. Um, so, because I'm, I, you know, I've made over the last couple of years, I've actually finally got back to music. I haven't released an album in six years, so I've recorded more than an album, probably two albums. But I don't know how they're coming out yet, or what the process is, and I'm putting all that together. Um, but then I did this feature for Swindle. So Swindle did a, is a great UK producer. We did a whole live band album with a set of great musicians sort of jazz-inspired um, live hip-hop album, and we're going to be performing a song. Uh, nice. I might you, you're going to see that a bit later. Ladies and gentlemen, the fantastic Akala! Yeah!